Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Aditi Alawat and I am a neurologist at Milford Regional Physician Group and today I'm really excited to talk to you all about uh, a topic uh, related to numb and tingling feet um, and I'm going to discuss two conditions, one is called neuropathy and one is called radiculopathy. So I hope you enjoy today's little talk and presentation. So the overview of today's presentation, we are going to be breaking down two conditions. At first, we're going to talk about what does it mean to actually have numb and tingly feet. Um, we're going to discuss what is neuropathy. We're going to discuss the causes of neuropathy because there are many, many different types and many patients come in with all different types of complaints and it's my job as your neurologist to kind of parse out why you could be having neuropathy. So I'll discuss that. We will then go into all the different types of treatments that we provide for patients with neuropathy. Um, we will then transition and talk about a second condition called radiculopathy, which is often a mimic of neuropathy um, and can often also happen at the same time as neuropathy, which is not something that most patients know about. Um, we'll talk about the different causes of that. And then lastly, we'll talk about a specific test that I perform in my lab over down the road at Milford Regional um, to help diagnose both neuropathy, radiculopathy, and other nerve diseases. Uh, and then we'll wrap up and talk about takeaway points and uh, go from there. Okay, so what do we mean when we say that we have numb feet? Well, it can actually mean a lot of different things for a lot of different patients, so I often like to spend the time to delve in with you about what exactly you're feeling and what, what you mean. Um, for some people, numb feet can mean that pins and needles sensation that is really uncomfortable and it feels like your foot or your hand is asleep. That is often a sign of neuropathy. Um, but it can also mean just a lack of sensation or you know just not feeling something, like when you go to the dentist and you get a Novocaine shot in your gums and everything goes completely numb. Uh, it can also uh, mean that you just don't feel where your feet are in space and you can be off balance. So all of those things together often encompass what we mean by numb and tingling feet. Um, and both of these kind of symptoms can be representative of both neuropathy and radiculopathy, as I said earlier. So let's kind of take a deep dive into each one. So what is neuropathy exactly? Well, it's a what I like to call a dysfunction or something going wrong with the little tiny teeny nerves that are found in your feet. Uh, they primarily are in your toes, um, but then the neuropathy or the nerves can start to get sick for so many different reasons which we'll talk about. Um, and it can then start to spread over either days, months, or years. Uh, most typically it spreads very, very slowly over years depending on what is the cause of your neuropathy. Um, and it usually starts in the toes and then spreads throughout the feet up to the ankles. It can then go up the legs up to about the knees. And then at that point, from the knees, it usually goes to the hands involving the fingertips and then beyond if it is more uh, serious. Symptoms again include a pure numbness, like a Novocaine sensation. But it could also be the pins and needles, feeling like something is crumpled up under your feet. A lot of times patients say, it feels like there's a sock crumpled up under my toes, and that's all that they feel. Um, feeling um, um, imbalanced when you walk, or it can often be really debilitating because it can be very, very painful, like a burning, a stabbing, or an itchy, kind of shocking feeling as well. So here are some cartoons to describe you know, what you could be feeling in your feet. Um, symptoms are often present throughout the day, but we often find that patients seem to be more bothered when it's at nighttime because that's when you're relaxing and going to bed and you can kind of just feel your nerves are overactive. So within neuropathy, there's actually lots of different types of neuropathy. Um, the main ones are motor, which means that the nerves in your feet uh, that go to the muscles to tell them what to do to make you strong or have activity can be sick. You can have sensory neuropathy, which is the main type where, you know, the little nerves in your feet that provide sensation are getting sick for some reason. Or you could have a sensory motor, which is kind of a combination. That's also very, very common. Lastly, there's a, a specific type called an autonomic neuropathy, which often happens in diabetes or genetic conditions. That often happens when um, 
with symptoms like dry, dry skin, flushing, sweating, irregular heartbeat, and um, gastrointestinal symptoms. That's pretty rare and doesn't happen very often, but when it does, you know, neurologists and other providers can help pick it up for you. Um, so as I said before, most patients do have a combination of sensory and motor neuropathy. Um, and oftentimes, sensation is the main problem with neuropathy, but you can also have a little bit of um, muscle weakness as well, and that can go on to cause some balance issues and falls. Um, notably, neuropathy is actually the most common type of nerve disorder in the entire world. So um, most people will have someone they know that suffers from neuropathy or will develop it yourself. Um, the chance of getting neuropathy increases as you age as well. So by the time most of us, you know, hopefully get into our 70s and 80s, most of us will have some kind of symptoms of neuropathy. Mostly it's usually very, very mild and, and manageable, but in very rare cases you can develop more symptoms that are debilitating, in which case you need a neurologist to kind of help you uh, deal with those symptoms. Um, two to seven percent of the worldwide population is diagnosed with neuropathy, but we know that that number is probably a lot higher. It's just that people don't often report when they have some mild symptoms of numbness and tingling. Um, also, neuropathy affects every single race, sex, so men, female, no matter what your ethnicity is, everyone is kind of at the whelm or at the um, mercy of neuropathy, so there's no certain countries or ethnicities that are more prone to developing neuropathy. Um, and you can, in some uh, cases, get neuropathy when you're younger. Uh, you know, even little babies and uh, children can get neuropathy. Those are rare cases and those are usually genetic, but it can happen. Um, and then, not all neuropathies are made the same, which we'll talk about, but there are more mild forms, which is the main focus of today's discussion, but there are very, very severe types of neuropathy, which again are uh, genetic causes um, and happen at a younger age. So, what causes neuropathy? There are a ton of different diseases, conditions, vitamin disorders that can cause neuropathy, but the main one is diabetes. I'm going to go into about diabetic neuropathy because that is mainly the cause of neuropathy that I see in most patients, especially living in America, um, as a lot of our population do, uh, does suffer from diabetes or prediabetes. Um, but the other causes include vitamin deficiencies. So there's a vitamin called B1 and a, a vitamin called B12. Sometimes, for some reason, you're not absorbing that vitamin. Um, which is often found in animal products like cheeses, meats, eggs, or in some patients who are vegetarian or vegan, they often don't get enough B12, and that can cause a neuropathy. So that's something I often test for a lot in the blood when patients come to see me. Um, there's also, there can also be an abnormal buildup of proteins in the blood, which happens just you know, kind of randomly or genetically. We don't really know why it happens in certain patients, but when we do find it, that's a reason that patients can have neuropathy, and we often can do something about it with treatment, and it can help to stop the spread of neuropathy. So it's an important thing for me to check. Infection, so oftentimes when patients come into the hospital, uh, they can develop a neuropathy because the body is fighting off an infection and then oftentimes the antibodies can start to cause the nerves to get sick. Um, certain infections like HIV, um, certain common colds, the COVID-19 um, virus has often been, has now been found to cause some mild forms of neuropathy and we're still learning more about how COVID-19 can affect the nerves. So we'll stay tuned on more information about that. Um, vitamin toxicity. So I early, earlier mentioned that vitamin B1 and B12, when they're low, can cause neuropathy. There's one vitamin called B6 that when it's actually too high, when you have too much of it, it can also attack the nerves. This uh, toxicity causes more of a burning and a painful neuropathy, whereas the B12 deficiency causes more of just like a plain numbness and balance issues. But there's no hard and fast rule, but that's typically what we found in patients. Vitamin uh, toxicity like B6 can happen sometimes if you take too much of the B complexes. Um, 
It's found in most multivitamins, which is fine at that dose, um, but it's something for you to discuss with your neurologist if you are taking just B6, because that's not always the best thing for you. A lot of different medications can sometimes cause neuropathy. Um, nowadays, I feel like medications less so are causing neuropathy than in the old days because we're more aware of it. And at the first sign of neuropathy, we kind of stop the medication um, before it gets too progressed. Um, oftentimes, chronic kidney disease or liver disease over time can also cause neuropathy. Um, just because systemically or, or full body, when the liver and the kidneys start to shut down, the nerves also start to get sick, um, and that can cause neuropathy. Genetics. Genetics is actually a pretty big one. Um, so if your parents or there's a strong family history of neuropathy, that could be due, due to diabetes, but it could also just be due to some kind of genetics in the family that can cause neuropathy. Um, so oftentimes, if there is a very strong family history without diabetes, we can sometimes do certain genetic tests uh, to find out if that's the reason for neuropathy. Uh, heavy alcohol use. I'm not talking just, you know, recreational alcohol use, but heavy daily alcohol use over years we've found can, you know, be uh, quite neurotoxic to the nerves and can cause um, balance, brain, and ner uh, nerve pain and issues. And then cancer. So a lot of different cancers um, can cause neuropathy. Oftentimes before the cancer even declares itself in a patient, like you might have a brewing cancer that hasn't yet been picked up, neuropathy can sometimes happen first before the cancer, uh, depending on the flavor of neuropathy. Um, not just a, a basic neuropathy, but a, a specific type of neuropathy can, can be hidden um, when a cancer is brewing. And so that's why it's always important to tell your doctors about the symptoms you're having because we can help kind of parse out if we think this is something to investigate further or if this is kind of a run-of-the-mill neuropathy. But certain cancers can cause you to have more of a neuropathy. And then autoimmune diseases. So diseases like, you know, thyroid, lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, specific conditions like Sjogren's and all kinds of other um, autoimmune diseases can make you more prone to having neuropathy as well. And then lastly, a big one is also chemotherapy. So there are certain chemo drugs that we know are, are just known to really cause neuropathy. Unfortunately, there's not much to do about it because we need chemotherapy as life-saving treatments, but we can help to manage your pain and symptoms. And as soon as the chemotherapy kind of stops, um, the thing that's damaging the nerves also kind of stops as well, but that's something to be aware of. And then lastly, or I think lastly, environmental toxins, heavy metals can also cause neuropathy. So certain pe uh, people working in certain industries have been known to um, have neuropathy like arsenic or mercury and things like that. So oftentimes we will test for that if you have a history. So. Do I have neuropathy? I know a lot of patients come in wondering, do they have it because of some symptoms they're having? Um, so your, your provider and your neurologist can help you sort that out. So we would, you know, in, in my clinic, I do a detailed history, perform an exam, um, and really understand if this is a neuropathy. We, um, some physical exam maneuvers include checking your strength, looking at your muscles and the skin, testing your sensation um, in a variety of different maneuvers, um, including how you feel pain, like with a little pinprick. We test vibration, position sense, we do balance testing, um, and we check reflexes as well, because sometimes reflexes can go down when you have neuropathy. Um, oftentimes, we do a lot of different blood tests. We do imaging with MRIs, and then lastly, the test called an EMG, which I'll talk about a little later. The main type of neuropathy that I want to kind of spend a little bit more focus on today is diabetic neuropathy because it's the most common complication of diabetes in America and worldwide. Um, it can occur in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes and approximately half, so 50% of patients with diabetes will develop some sort of neuropathy in their lifetime. Um, the importance is that if you have diabetes, it's really, um, it's important for you to stay vigilant with your providers to look for signs of neuropathy um, so that you can take the appropriate measures so that you do avoid, you know, the, the very serious complications like infections, 
injuries, falls, ulcers, and things like that. Um, also, what I think is interesting to know is that even if you're just in the pre-diabetes range, as uh, many people are, and you're trying to work with your doctor to kind of, you know, work on your risk factors to lower that number and, and not get in the diabetes range, even in that pre-diabetic range, you can be developing a neuropathy even at that early stage. So it's important that if you ever reach that pre-diabetic range to really work with yourself and your, and your providers to get your numbers down um, to prevent a neuropathy from building up, even if you never develop true diabetes. If you stay in that pre-diabetic range, you can still develop a neuropathy. Um, even just having a little bit of high cholesterol being overweight puts you more at risk of having a neuropathy. The most important thing uh, to improve when you do have diabetes is to just control those sugars and that number called the A1C. Um, keeping that as low as possible and doing all the things with your healthy lifestyle, insulin or medications and keeping your glycemic numbers low will really help to keep your nerves as healthy as they can be. Um, also things like you know reducing body weight, blood pressure and cholesterol goals. And then foot care, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit to keep the feet nice and healthy and circulation going. The other thing is that I talked about having low B12 levels, especially in people who are vegetarian or if you have any kind of intestinal issues because you might not absorb B12 as well. In diabetic patients, the B12 levels can sometimes also be low, which for reasons we don't really understand. So we often check B12 levels in diabetic patients too and just make sure that's beefed up a little bit to keep the nerves nice and healthy. I talked about this a little bit on the last slide, but just to reiterate, you know, even having heart disease or high cholesterol, smoking, overweight, and high blood pressure, that also puts you at risk of having neuropathy. So it's important that we all, you know, you keep, you keep those um, factors under control. So complications from neuropathy, I think it makes pretty, you know, pretty good sense that as you lose the ability to sense things, if you get more numb, you can stop feeling hot and cold. When you walk on surfaces, you can often miss that there's like a pin or a little rock under your leg, and you can often get some injuries. Injuries that normally cause pain, like stepping on something, um, or if you're wearing a shoe or a, a high heel that's too tight that causes a blister, um, you, you necessarily won't feel that when you get neuropathy. So it's important to really inspect your feet daily, top to bottom, in between the toes, especially if you have diabetes, and even if you haven't been diagnosed with a neuropathy, um, because sometimes can be really, really subtle. And so it's important to, to daily take a look at your feet um, and notice if you have any small scratches or injuries and get that taken care of so it doesn't become a bigger problem. Um, this is extreme, but some of the more complicated things that can happen is that if, if neuropathy goes on too long, you can get ulcers and kinds of you know, serious infections that are harder to deal with. Okay, so trips and, uh, tips and tricks to help if you do have diabetes in general. As I said earlier, blood sugar, blood sugar, blood sugar. It's important to keep it under control. Happy sugar, happy nerves. Um, and then taking special care of your feet. So I often tell my patients to Wear shoes or slippers all the time. Walking barefoot puts you more at risk of having injuries um, and little snags on carpets or, or on gravel or walking around in the summertime. I know we all like to kind of feel the hot sun on our feet. It's important to wear shoes because you can get injured and um, cuts and bruises don't always heal as quickly um, in patients who have diabetes. Um, it's important to keep your, to your toenails kind of trimmed carefully. Um, and I recommend that you cut straight across, straight across the nail and file them down and not keep nails too long, especially in the feet. Um, it's important not to just pop blisters or cut your cuticles on your own because that can introduce infections. Um, and then I often recommend that most patients with diabetes with neuropathy to go see a podiatrist to have really holistic foot care and oftentimes getting pedicures or getting your nails trimmed by a professional is also recommended. Um, I also recommend that people wash their feet every day with warm soap and water, so to get the, the surface layer of dirt off the feet. And then after you know drying the feet, to put a nice moisturizing cream throughout the toes, in between the toes, on the surface and on the bottom of the feet to keep them moisturized. And then I alluded to this before, but check your feet every day 
And sometimes it's hard to kind of maneuver your foot and look on the bottom, but I would take a mirror if you don't have someone else to look at it, just to make sure there's no cuts and bruises on the bottom. Um, wearing socks that are not too tight and also making sure that you have really good fitting shoes that are not too narrow or, or cutting down on your toes is also important. And then also checking inside your shoes to make sure there's no hidden rocks or little things that can cut your feet. So this is just a diagram showing um, how to you know, take care of your feet. So trimming across the nails, not wearing ill-fitted shoes, um, and looking at your feet with a mirror is often helpful. So one important topic to talk about is the neuropathic pain because neuropathy can, you know, oftentimes it doesn't bother patients because they just feel a little numb. In other cases, neuropathy can be very, very debilitating because it's incredibly painful. Um, and it's kind of a hidden or silent pain because people can't really look at you and say, oh, you have neuropathy and you're suffering because they don't see like a physical injury. Um, but it can be really painful, tingling, sharp, stabbing, burning. It can keep patients up at night. Um, and so that does require a lot of, you know, a, the, the help of a professional to help you deal with that and, and live a more comfortable life. Um, pain can be constant or it can come and go. Usually, as I said earlier, when you kind of stop and rest and, and, and stop from standing on your feet, that's when patients often notice that the neuropathy symptoms come back kind of with a vengeance. And patients can also feel a lot of pain when, when feet are just kind of stroked or touched gently, or if a sheet is kind of rubbing on the feet, that can often bring out a lot of neuropathic pain, which is often you know, very annoying to deal with. And um, as I said earlier, neuropathic pain can be very severe and affect daily life, and it's something that you know, um, we as professionals kind of recognize and want to help you deal with. Uh, neuropathic pain can also keep people from not sleeping and eating well and really impact quality of life. So we do have a number of different treatments for neuropathic pain. Um, and oftentimes, it usually requires a really um, nuanced or, or combination of treatments to get patients feeling more comfortable. But we do have a lot of success in, in making people's quality of life a lot better. Um, so treatments include medicines and activities. And no single treatment or combination works for every single patient. And people often have their own special combination that really works for them. And so it's often a trial and error or a little bit of a dance to find out what's best for you. But once you find the right combination, patients often feel a lot better and their lives you know, improve significantly. Um, so there's a lot of different types of medicines that we use uh, to treat neuropathy. Um, and these medications are often used to treat other things. So a lot of different depression medications um, we've actually found are very, very good for calming down nerves and for nerve pain. So a lot of medications in the class of SSRIs, like Prozac and other medications, um, some of the newer agents are actually excellent at treating neuropathic pain. Um, and then oftentimes seizure medications at lower doses, not at high doses that treat seizures, but at lower doses, we've also found are very, very good at treating neuropathic pain. So those are some of the options that we would discuss in the clinic um, depending on the type of pain you have. Also, there's over-the-counter solutions like lidocaine patches or numbing sprays and creams that you can find at your CVS or Walgreens that often help a lot, taking cold, um, baths or putting your feet in ice water can sometimes help. And then oftentimes we can give injections or shots of numbing uh, medication into nerves if it's very extreme to help kind of calm down some irritation. Other um, important treatments which I often really stress to my patients that make a world of difference are non-medication treatments. And that includes physical therapy, uh, that's my number one kind of shtick for patients. Physical therapy helps so much with all different types of pain, but especially for neuropathy. Um, working with a counselor, actually, just kind of talking through having chronic pain and having someone kind of understand the daily struggle is often really important, and I found that a lot of patients actually um, benefit from doing that. Relaxation or massage therapy can really help, especially massaging out the feet or higher up and kind of relaxing the muscle tension that you can often acquire when you're in a lot of pain. And then acupuncture has also been shown to um, really help patients with neuropathy. 
So to find the best treatments for you, again, we can often work together to kind of um, try a combination of medications, over-the-counter, and non-medical treatments to help neuropathy. Okay, so now we're going to take a swift turn and talk about another reason why you can have numbness, tingling, or kind of a burning pain in your feet and legs, and that is radiculopathy. So what do I mean by radiculopathy? Well, that actually just means that you have pinched nerves coming from your low back. So radiculopathy is a condition where you have pinched nerves, and basically this is the spinal cord and canal, and these are your bones in your spinal cord, and little nerves leave at each level in the spine, and right in the spine, because of arthritis or slipped discs, these nerves can get pinched off, particularly in the low back in this region. This is a zoom in right here of the nerves in between the bones. When these get pinched off, they can cause symptoms that actually seem really similar to neuropathy, but it's actually due to this condition called a radiculopathy. Um, oftentimes, it can cause pain, it can cause the numbness, it can cause the stabbing or burning that we talked about earlier. Um, and it can go down one leg, it can go down both legs, or it can just start in the feet, actually, and move upwards. So it can, it can present itself in a lot of different ways. Sometimes, though, in radiculopathy, it often is a little worse on one side than the other compared to neuropathy, which tends to be more kind of symmetric and happening in both feet at the same time. If you have very, very severe radiculopathy or pinched nerves, it can sometimes cause more serious problems like leg weakness or problems with your bowel or bladder, so it's important to be seen by a neurologist. Um, for radiculopathy, symptoms are often worse um, when you are kind of standing upright or walking around versus the school of thought is for neuropathy, symptoms are more you know, troublesome when you're lying down and resting. That's not a hard and fast rule, and oftentimes patients have both symptoms at the same time. So that's not something that we use all the time, but it's just kind of um, something to think about. Um, usually with radiculopathy, you can kind of feel better if you sit down or you kind of bend your back to open up the spine a little bit. Um, and oftentimes it's a classic teaching that when you, you lean over a shopping cart when you're shopping, you kind of feel a little bit better too. Um, the thing is that's important is that you don't always have to have back pain or low back pain to have a pinched nerve. Um, and sometimes just simple tingling in your toes or just a little muscle tightness from time to time can be enough um, to cause a pinched nerve. So pinched nerves often happen in lots of different patients. Um, most of us at some point in time will develop a pinched nerve. Certain times it's more important to get seen by your doctor right away, and that includes you know, really, really new, acute, or, or serious back pain that kind of pops up out of the blue. And especially if it travels down the leg or into your groin and it's really bothersome, that's a time to go see your doctor. Um, if the back or leg pain is also associated with weakness, where your leg is giving out or it does not feel the same as the other side, or any problems with controlling your bowel uh, bowels or bladder and back pain, that's always a time to go get checked out by your doctor. Um, sometimes you can develop a condition called a foot drop where your foot kind of just slaps on the ground and it's not picking itself up appropriately. That could be a sign of a pinched nerve as well, so it's important to be seen by your physician for that. And then anytime if you have very bad back pain along with a fever, it's important to be checked out because that could um, imply that your nerve is getting pinched and there's an infection there at the same time. However, those are very serious causes. Most, most times patients just have mild pinched nerves that over months to years can cause the tingling in the feet. So if you have one of those milder conditions where you just have arthritis over years or months that have built up and you have a pinched nerve, what can you do about it? Well, either way, it's really important that you stay as active as you can, even if you do have you know, tingling, burning, or even some bad low back pain. Um, you shouldn't stay in bed or rest too long. It's always important to rest and listen to your body, so it, you know, not to push yourself too much, but it's also important not to just stay bedridden when you do have back pain or a pinched nerve, but to get up and to stretch and to do some kind of exercise is actually really important. Um, sometimes laying in bed or bed rest can make the back injury worse because things kind of spasm up and get more stiff. So it's important, even though it hurts, to kind of um, move around a little bit. 
And this is where physical therapy is really, really important because um, with the use of professionals, your therapist, they will help you uh, or teach you the right exercises and the right things to do when you do have back pain or tingling in the feet. Um, again, you know, don't worry that you might do yourself more harm, but it's always important to talk to your doctor first and your physical therapist and then learn what kinds of exercises you should do for back pain. Um, so for a pinched nerve or radiculopathy, again, the symptoms are pretty, um, or the treatments are pretty similar as to a neuropathy. Pain medications can be prescribed by your neurologist or your other provider. Often the same medications we use for neuropathy also work for radiculopathy because it's both, they're, both of these conditions are nerve issues. Just neuropathy is happening down in your feet and moving up, and in a pinched nerve in the back, it's happening higher up, but it's all the same nerves. Um, medicines to relax the muscles can also help for a short time, like muscle relaxants, to kind of help loosen up the muscles around the spine. Um, physical therapy is my big, um, I'm a big proponent of physical therapy. Acupuncture and massage always helps as well. Okay, so how to diagnose neuropathy and radiculopathy. So I talked earlier about seeing a neurologist where we can perform a physical exam, listen to what exactly your symptoms are, um, and then doing blood work and imaging. But there's also a specific test that I perform where we can really directly study the nerves and muscles, and I can figure out, do you have neuropathy, do you have radiculopathy, or do you have a combination of both? Um, and this specific test is called an EMG nerve conduction study. So what is an EMG? It's kind of a weird but very, very cool test. And an EMG stands for an electromyography. And it's a diagnostic procedure where we can really study the health of your nerves and your muscles and the nerve cells that control them. It's a two-part test. Uh, the first part is called the NCS, or the nerve conduction study. The second part is called the EMG, or the electromyography. But all together, one, part one and two, we just kind of call it the EMG study. In the first part, we put little stickers on you, and then we perform little um, electrical impulses, and we can study how fast nerves are traveling, do we get a high response, and from there I can kind of figure out if there's a neuropathy, radiculopathy, or both. And in the second part, we study your muscles directly to find out if there's been muscle damage or if there's been nerve injury to the muscles. Uh, tech, uh, usually, this test is performed by a neurologist and a technician at the same time. Again, so an EMG, this is a picture of a machine of an EMG. Um, it's often a computer with just a bunch of buttons and controls. It's usually about an hour to an hour and a half, depending on what is the condition we're, we're testing and how bad the, the, the problem is. And it, not, it can um, diagnose all kinds of muscle and nerve diseases, not just neuropathy and radiculopathy. Again, the first part of the test is small electrical impulses, and we can study the nerves. The second part involves a small acupuncture-sized needle that we put gently into the skin, and we can tell all kinds of interesting things by listening to your muscles. Um, and it's a very, very cool test. Okay, so we're wrapping up now. Uh, so I just want to uh, talk about some of the main takeaway points about neuropathy and radiculopathy. So one, not all neuropathy and radiculopathy is, is you know, made the same. Um, there are serious forms, there are mild forms, there are forms that spread quickly, there are forms that spread very, very slowly, um, and diabetes is the main um, cause of neuropathy, and that's why it's important to get um, checked out by a provider and a neurologist so we can help sort out what type of neuropathy you have and what's the best treatment for you. Uh, diabetes is the leading cause of neuropathy, but again, there are so many different forms and types, in, uh, including related to vitamins, medications, family history, um, chemotherapy and cancer. So that's why it's important to know what type you have. Um, physical therapy, a good foot and body hygiene and a healthy lifestyle is really beneficial for everyone, whether you have neuropathy, radiculopathy or both. And pain may not go away completely because the neuropathy is there, but if we can help to ease your burden and improve your quality of life with medications and other interventions, that is our goal. So you are not alone and we completely understand and are here to help you. And um, sharp stabbing pain, it's not fun. <laughs>
Uh, so Milford Regional Neurology, we're just um, here on um, Prospect Street in the Hill Building. Uh, we are a new practice of two providers, and both myself and my partner, we treat neuropathy, and we'd be happy to serve anyone who comes, to, comes down. Thank you. Thank you.